Hi, everybody. I'm Christy Wilson. I'm a software engineer at Google, uh, where I lead the Tecton project. Tecton, which we'll be talking about a little bit, is a continuous delivery platform built on top of Kubernetes. And somehow, I've been working on it for three years already, which is hard to Great. believe. <laughs> But even more exciting than that is uh, I'm excited to actually be doing this talk in person. It's been at least a year and a half since the last one. So thanks for encouraging me to do this, Kim. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while since we did a talk together. And so, hey, everyone. I am Kim Lewandowski. Um, I'm currently at Google, but Friday is actually my last day. Uh, so I'm very excited to do this talk with Christy. And she promised me that we're going to do talks even after I leave Google. So yay. <laughs> Um, I worked in the supply chain space for the last three or four years, started um, the Tecton project with Christy, and currently uh, leading our Google open source security team. So it's been exciting, and here we go. <laughs> so Christy, let's just kick things off with a demo. Uh, I hear you've been working on a new website. Yeah, uh, let me show you. I've been working on a cool cat picture website. <laughs> As one does. And, and while she's pulling this up, she made, uh, Christy made amazing goose diagrams of the both of us that you'll see on the slides. Um, she's very, along with being an amazing engineer, she's a very good artist. I didn't know you were going to flatter me so much. Uh -huh, uh -huh. and, and she even wore the shirt for the occasion. <laughs> but the, the open SSF goose is our, is, our, is our goose mascot in the Open Source Security Foundation. So, all right. So enough geese and back to cats. Uh, I've been working on this cat picture website. If you're familiar with Tecton, you might know that we sometimes have cat mascots for our releases, so I wanted to make a website to show them off. But I feel like it's kind of a little bit plain, like it could use a bit more color. Dogs. It, it, or dogs. <laughs> no dogs, no dogs. It would be cool if I could make this text rainbow colored somehow, but I don't really know a lot of HTML, so. I'm not sure how I do that, but maybe I know of a library. Maybe I can just use that library. Uh, let's see. So I happen to know about this rainbow library that will actually make my text rainbow colored. So I'm just going to add that dependency into my project. As one does. As one does. I just call this function. It's really easy. And uh, let's see what happens. Go back to the cat website. OK, look at that. I've got rainbow text. It was that easy. Dependencies are really great. Um, let's just go over here. Wait, wait a second. What is this? Hold on. Every time I refresh this page, I'm getting this output about a malicious binary? What is that? Hmm. And the only thing I really changed was pulling in a dependency. So let's take a look at this dependency I pulled in. So it's the rainbow HTML project. And look at the source code. Hmm, there's already something kind of suspicious there. <laughs> Let's take a look at the actual code that I'm calling. So I'm calling a function called text. It's doing some stuff with HTML. There's some colors. That all seems reasonable. But it's calling this do setup function. Oh, wait a minute. So this is actually writing an executable file and executing it. And actually, it's embedding a binary inside of this Go package. So I don't think we want to use this dependency after all. Let's go back to our slides. All right, so I'm really glad that we caught that, but what if the binary hadn't just told us that it was there? Most malicious dependencies aren't going to just announce themselves. <laughs> that was very helpful. <laughs> so I mean, that's a good point about malicious dependencies. And, and of course, that's what we're here to talk about today. So here's quickly like, what we want to cover. Um, talk to you first about what we consider a dependency, um, and then talk to you about why you should care about risks like this. And then we'll talk really briefly at a high level about how Google handles third-party code. And then we'll see our cool trick. Um, and then we'll follow up with other helpful tools in this space. So let's talk a little bit about malicious dependencies. First, it's probably good to make sure that we're talking about the same thing when we say dependency. So what we're talking about is the code that your code depends on, and the code that that code depends on, the code that depends on. We're talking about all of those libraries that we import so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time we want to do something. 
And of course, not everyone is nice. Um, we have attackers that are trying to take advantage of tricking developers into downloading and using these malicious dependencies. Um, and today, like we're focusing on, we're at the open source conference and that's where a lot of risk lies. So that's what we're talking about today. And, and so this is a really high level diagram of a typical software supply chain. Um, and this is where you can see where all the weaknesses are along a supply chain and all the different threat uh, vectors. And so getting malicious dependencies into a production system is one of the most common software supply chain attacks today. And we're seeing this um, unfortunately way more frequently than anyone wants to. And here's just a list of some of the common tack types, like the terminology. So if you see these terms in the media or whatever, you know, this is kind of just some of the, the more common ones that we're seeing. Um, the first one is dependency confusion attack. And this is where it's tricking a build system to pull in the wrong dependency in your software supply chain. And then typo squatting is when um, an attacker just changes the, changes the letters or changes the symbols and tries to confuse you to download the wrong package. So image dash editor, might, they might rename it to image dash better editor or something and try to trick you into, into downloading this uh, malicious package. And then project takeover, we've seen a few examples of this. And this is where um, an attacker will try to come in and get um, project, become an owner of the project and, and get you know, commit rights um, of a popular project and, and maybe convince the owner of that project to, um, to, to take, take it over and then they slip in malicious code and then you know, all of a sudden you have a malicious dependency. So this is all pretty scary. And the more you think about it, it just kind of starts to get worse. I've always thought about dependencies as a way to make things easier, but there's a dark side. Of course. It's so easy for me to pull in a dependency and most, mostly it makes sense for me to do it. I don't have to implement and maintain the code myself. I can focus on whatever it is I'm actually trying to do. And if there are bug fixes or other improvements in the library, I'm going to benefit from those. But it's not always safe. And just a simple command like this actually has the potential to accidentally give somebody root access to one of my production systems. And so it, it's getting scarier. I mean, that's the fact of the matter here. This is a recent report, and you may have seen this stat now on a few other decks um, at, the, at this conference, is that there is a 650% increase in just 2021 alone for these software supply chain attacks. And the majority of these are like the typo squatting variety, the dependency confusion, and, um, and uh, yeah, the account takeovers. And again, this is not all like just theoretical. People aren't just making this stuff up. Here's a timeline. I run out of space. I don't have all of them on here um, of recent attacks that we've seen in the last couple of years. Um, like for example, Ruby Gems, they found 760 typo squatted packages uh, in, the, in the repository, in the gems thing and had to pull them down. And then the, the great suspender attack was one of these account takeover attacks where someone came in and say, hey, I wanna help out with your project. You know, I've got some changes I want to make, earned the owner's trust, and then took it over and then started, um, you know, putting malicious code into a very popular Chrome extension. And that was taken, the extension was taken down. And the, micro, the Microsoft Halo attack was a dependency confusion attack um, that we saw recently. So this is the problem that we're looking at. It makes so much sense to leverage dependencies, but it's really easy to mess up. It's hard to do the right thing, and we don't even really have a lot of guidance about what the right thing is to do. Another interesting fact from the report that Kim was mentioning is that of all these dependencies we're using, only about 25% of them are even being updated regularly and pulling in bug fixes. And as software gets more complex, which it definitely is, we'll, you might find yourself pulling in hundreds or in some cases even thousands of dependencies to your project. And like Kim was showing, it's not just theoretical because we are actually seeing more and more attacks that take advantage of this. Uh, okay, so now that we've sufficiently scared you, let's just take a really high level look of how Google handles third party code. And you can see a lot of this, I added the link at the top of the slide, like this is all on our public website about you know, what you need to do um, if you wanna bring in third party code as a Google engineer. Um, so the first thing is you have to be an assigned owner. So if Christy wanted to in ingest her rainbow HTML, she would have to be take ownership of that dependency. She would be responsible for keeping it updated, monitoring for vulnerabilities, patching it, um, license compliance, and things like that. 
And again, a really high level diagram. I think we have some Googlers that can probably <laughs> speak to more detail if we need um, in, in some of like how Google works. But I think people know that Google is pretty famous for having a mono repo. So even third party dependencies come into this mono repo. Um, and we have a trusted build system that's got, you know, we have very high security requirements around our build system. Um, we're capturing metadata along the entire supply chain for these artifacts, and we can go back and verify um, all the properties of them. We, we know when there's a change that's pushed out, we know where the code is running, we can see what's happening. There's nothing, there's nothing too magic here. Um, I think you know, any organization can kind of cobble something like uh, this together with enough time, whether that's the best thing for a company to do, you know, who knows. Um, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't work for everyone. Like you're limited, you know, we can only run one version of something. So if I don't like her rainbow HTML version, like I'm kind of stuck with it because she's the owner of that third party package. Um, and then a few other, you know, things that I mentioned. And so of course, you know, we always ask ourselves, like, can we, can we even do better as a large organization? There's a lot of risk of depending on third party software. We're seeing the attacks rise. We're, we're seeing examples of this. So like, what can we do as an organization, as a community, um, just to make this whole uh, uh, situation better? So there are a lot of different things to address and we can't get to all of them at once. So is there anything that we can do right now? Let's get back to my cat picture website. What if that malicious dependency hadn't been as helpful as it was and I didn't realize it's there? Let's see what would happen. Okay, so let's say, let's say I didn't see any of that. <laughs> so if you remember, the only changes I've made are pulling in this dependency and then calling the function. So I'm going to commit this. And I'm going to push my branch. So over in GitHub, let's open a pull request with those changes. So here is my branch. Here are the changes that we were just looking at. Open pull request. And right away you can see that we actually have a required GitHub action that's running that's going to be scoring my dependencies, which we're going to talk a bit about what that means. Um, so what that's doing is it's using a project that we're going to be looking at in more detail called uh, OSSF Scorecard. So this is a project that's all about looking at a project and looking at some of these kind of known problems that they can have and known weaknesses and then scoring the project. So let's see what happens in our GitHub action. So this GitHub action is actually calling, uh, creating a Tekton pipeline and running it. I'm gonna get into a bit more detail about that in a second. Let's let it run. It's done a git clone. Now it's running the scorecard. All right, and it's failing. Okay, so ultimately this pipeline is failing. Let's take a look at why. So we have a bunch of output from Scorecard about all kinds of different checks that it's doing and the failures it's finding. And actually most projects do fail, <laughs> most of these checks. Unfortunately. Uh, but some are more important than others. And so ultimately we had a required check, which was the check to make sure there are no binary artifacts in the repo. And this check actually did notice that there's a binary artifact in the repo that I was adding as a dependency, so it failed. And so even if I wasn't paying attention as a reviewer, you know, I didn't notice that there was a dependency being pulled in here. Fortunately, this check has failed and it saved me. So let's look at what actually happened here in a bit more detail. Okay, so thanks to the automation, we were able to catch the bad dependency. Let's break down what we just saw. So I used a GitHub Actions workflow that connected to my Tekton cluster in GKE, which executed a Tekton pipeline, and then that finally ran a tool for evaluating Go dependencies with scorecard. So at this point, if you're familiar with GitHub Actions and Tekton, you might be wondering, why am I using both of them? So the easiest answer is because I'm very biased and I work on Tekton, so I wanted to use Tekton. <laughs> it's got a cool logo. <laughs> but secondly, let me just talk a bit about what Tekton is. 
So Tekton is a continuous delivery system built on top of Kubernetes. One of the goals is to provide a specification for CD workloads that's portable across CD systems. So actually mixing something like GitHub Actions with Tekton is very much in line with those goals. And another thing that's cool about this kind of portability is that before I hooked any of this up to GitHub Actions, I could actually run the tasks and pipelines in my own cluster, and when I ran into things, I could debug them there. So we just saw GitHub Actions triggering Tekton, which used scorecards to evaluate my project's dependencies. Oh, that slides me. <laughs> All right, so a little bit more on um, the scorecards project. Uh, so this is a newer project. We, we created it in the OpenSSF about a year ago, and the goals were pretty simple. Like, we wanted a way to automate the security posture of these open source projects um, so we could make better decisions on the risk that we were willing to take um, and, and give developers just more insight in, into these open source projects. And then, and then the sub-goal is really to help inspire projects to earn a better score. Um, you know, a lot of these open source projects are kind of single maintainer or not security experts or just don't even realize that some of these things are best practices. And, and so that was hopefully like, you know, we want to encourage you, encourage you to get a better score on your project. Um, the, oh, and the last thing, I just got, um, I just got uh, an update today that we have public data for over 150,000 GitHub repos today. Um, and these are, this is a public data set, so it's all stored in BigQuery. I'm not sure if you're querying BigQuery, but anyway, it's there. Um, and we're pulling in the data in a few different places. And the project originally started out as like a pass-fail on, on these security checks, but now we've moved into a model where it's a zero through 10, and we kind of give a confidence of like how confident we are that it meets these um, specific criteria. I don't think Rainbow HTML made it into that cache yet. <laughs> No worries. Uh, so here's a, here's a list of the, of the um, current heuristics we see today, uh, or that we have today. And of course, all, I think every single project that we're talking about today, except for one, is actually open source. So, you know, if there's a, if there's a heuristic you'd like to see, like definitely open a pull request or, or what have you. But um, a few of these, like our branch protection. So we want to see if branch protection is turned on the repo. We want to see if maintainers like have access to push to the, to the main branch without, you know, without going through like a pull request process. Uh, we want to see how many contributors are uh, a part of the project or how many organizations are involved. And then we're doing other checks around uh, like fuzzing. Fuzzing looks for vulnerabilities. So is the project integrated with fuzzing? Um, it doesn't have a CII badge. <laughs> this one's near and dear to David's heart. <laughs> you know, this is a list of best practices that we uh, encourage uh, projects to follow. And then this data is a little stale, but this is an aggregate of, I think, when we had like 50,000 repos uh, that we, we had scorecard data for and just looking at the aggregate metrics. And unfortunately, there's a lot more red. <laughs> and so I think it's a goal, you know, make this graph more green than red. Um, is what we're going for here. So let's talk a little bit again about malicious dependencies and how scorecard fits in with them. So sometimes a library is intentionally malicious, like the one that we were looking at. Uh, other times it's accidental. But lastly, even if there's nothing particularly malicious in a library, if you're not following best practices, then your library is open to some of these attacks. For example, if you're not requiring any kind of code reviews, for patches, then there's a higher chance that somebody might be able to sneak something malicious into your library. So what Scorecard can do for you is it can identify some of these overt problems, like unpatched vulnerabilities, but it can also give you a signal about how vulnerable a project is to some of these known attacks. So in the demo that you just saw, I used a proof of concept tool I made for evaluating Go dependencies. And this is the kind of thing that you could potentially do for your own project and for whatever languages you're working with. So what the tool does is first it grabs all the dependencies of the project, including the dependencies of the dependencies. Then it resolves vanity URLs, which is a Go-specific thing. And for all the GitHub-based projects, it runs scorecard against them. It summarizes any of the failures, well, all of the failures that it finds, and it fails completely if it finds any known vulnerabilities or any binary artifacts. So you may be wondering if this is really worth it and what it gets you. It's not foolproof. But I think if you compare it to the alternative, which is relying on people to catch things, then you can kind of see the value. It can also do a lot to just guide reviewers. For example, 
take the check that um, will tell you if a project hasn't been updated for several months. As a reviewer, you could see that failing and you could decide whether or not that's important to you. Maybe you're okay with that. Maybe you want something that's being updated more regularly. But without something like scorecard guiding you, as a reviewer, you might not even know what to look for. And I think you'll find this especially useful if you haven't been paying very much attention to your dependencies so far and they've just been building up. If you run scorecard against them, I guarantee you'll find some interesting things. <laughs> So yeah, so scorecards is one new tool in this space. Unfortunately, it doesn't solve all of our uh, software supply chain security issues. And, uh, but we do have a lot of other tools that we wanted to talk about today that can also help in this journey. Um, and, and so the first one is another, uh, another project in the open SSF called All Star. And All Star is a bit newer than scorecards. Uh, I think we launched it, I don't know, several couple months ago. And it's meant to be a complementary app to the scorecards project. And so um, what it does is it, it has real-time enforcements of some of the scorecards checks. And it, it allows you to define like what user-defined actions you want it to take if it sees that it's failing one of these. So for example, if you're a maintainer on a project and you install the scorecard app, or sorry, the all-star app, it, run, it, it actually runs as a GitHub, it's called a GitHub app inside your repo, and then you can say if it fails the branch protection, it can either try to automatically turn back on branch protection, it could create an issue, or I think maybe it emails you. I don't know, maybe that's a, a, a feature that we wanted to add. Um, one of the things that Allstar could help with is, is the code cov attack where dependencies weren't pinned and that's something it could pick up on and, and alert you on. And then another project that I wanted to mention, this is a Google project that was also launched I think in June, but one of the interesting things uh, is that it's pulling in the scorecard data. So this is a site called depths.dev. You can go to it, you can type in a project, and you can actually get a, one of the things that it shows you is a graph of all the dependencies of, of a project um, and the scorecard results that are coming out. Uh, right here, we're looking at the Kubernetes project, <laughs> and the graph is a little bit daunting, but just to give you like a full breath of like how scary, you know, this, this world that we're operating in. It's like many, many dependencies that these big projects rely on. Hey, Kim. <laughs> I came across this trailer. I was wondering if maybe you could explain it to me. What? What? No. I had no idea. What? What, what is that? <laughs> I mean, I wish I knew. <laughs> so, another big project that we're excited about within the Open SSF. Not again. Okay. <laughs> is uh, something that we call Salsa, and that's how we pronounce it. It stands for uh, Supply Chain Levels for Software Artifacts. And it's a framework uh, around software supply chain integrity. So where Scorecards is about kind of the artifact itself, and there might be some overlap, you know, in the future, Salsa is all about the framework around, like, how does that source code get committed and the path that it takes all the way to being, you know, a usable artifact. Um, we, you know, as one does before they're about to leave Google, you put a film together, a feature film, and, and, and trying to explain the salsa framework, um, you know, to get, to get people more interested in these types of topics, and we try to make it fun. I think the full video is coming out in QCon. I think you have to do your own segment before we can release it. <laughs> um, so, so this is something we're really excited about. Uh, in, in the OpenSSF, and, and we really want to ensure that software artifacts meet end-to-end -end integrity um, standards. It was inspired by what we do internally in Google. Uh, different, you know, different, our different build systems and like our source repository have to meet these specific requirements before we, tr you know, trust them. And, and everyone has their own sort of definition of trust. Um, Let's see. And, and a very big topic in the the repo today is is salsa personified as chips or chips and salsa or a dancer. And, and, and luckily, maybe we have that partly solved. I don't know, the, the video kind of talks to it more as chips, but a, a, a Googler a colleague of ours drew the amazing goose logo, as one does, with a salsa, with a salsa dress on. <laughs> and, and so here's a table of the requirements at each of the salsa levels. This might be a little outdated, but I think it's fairly accurate now. We're working on this with the community. Uh, we have bi-weekly community meetings and, and lots of folks that are involved and actually just helping us sort of make sure we have the right 
um, requirements right that fits different use cases and, and, and whatnot. Um, I think the note, you know, the thing to note here is like, while the higher levels of salsa today look very hard to achieve for these large projects, like any, any of the requirements that a project end up, ends up meeting, it, it just means it's that much more secure. So it's not like all are lost if you only make it to, you know, salsa one with a few more requirements or something. I think these things are all very important um, for the trustworthiness of, of artifacts. Um, and then, yeah, and so, and, and this is just a kind of a high level picture again of how like the salsa framework can fit in with dependencies. So as Christy was saying, you got dependency, dependency, you know, oh, turtles all the way down of these dependencies. And it, it's a, I think it's an open discussion or an open issue maybe in the salsa framework today is like, maybe we should consider actually adding another higher level or like the, in that higher level, you know, all of the direct dependencies need to meet a specific salsa level. So it, it really can get, you know, the, the scope of these things can kind of explode. But again, any improvement for security is a good improvement. <laughs> Another project that's very dear to my heart is Tecton Chains. So I talked a little bit earlier about what Tecton is. It's built by extending Kubernetes. Tecton runs pipelines and tasks inside a Kubernetes cluster. And one of the benefits of using Kubernetes is it's so extensible. So Tecton Chains is an optional controller that you can add to an existing Tecton cluster, and it observes the execution of tasks and pipelines. If it sees an image being built, it can generate provenance and sign those images for you. It's early days, but the idea is that eventually it'll be able to recognize and do this for all kinds of artifacts which means you'd be able to write your tasks and pipelines without having to add any kind of explicit supply chain security support into them, and Tecton Chains would just add it for you. Well, cool. We, we made it almost to the end. <laughs> uh, so as I said, and as probably most of you know, software supply chain security is kind of this huge, you know, huge problem, huge thing that we all sort of have to deal with today. Um, and, there, and there's really no single solution here. Uh, I did attempt to break down the problem in a bit more tractable, tractable way that, that we can start framing it. Um, the first part is awareness, and I think this is where the scorecards projects help, like know the hygiene of the stuff that you're shipping into your production systems. Um, and, then, and then that ties into automation. I think a key to a lot of these things are it needs to be really easy for developers to, to either implement or use or understand. And that's where we see the All-Star project and the Tecton Chains project doing a lot of that automation for you. And then I think the last bit is really a cultural shift. Uh, and that's where we think maybe new standards and processes come into play, the Salsa framework being an example of that. And then that's, that's a picture of my kids. They like to pick up trash. <laughs> and so one of my takeaways, and I was trying to figure out how to sneak a Quick, a uh, cute picture of them in there, and, and this is a Boy Scouts thing, is like, always leave the software cleaner than you found it. <laughs> so if you want to help your fellow campers out, uh, if you want to help your fellow developers out, <laughs> run scorecard against the projects that you work on and see where your gaps are. If we all improve just one or two of these things that we find in our own projects, then open source software as a whole would be that much less vulnerable. Yay. <laughs> And then, uh, yeah, our last slide. So here's a link to a lot of the projects that we talked about today. Um, mo uh, all of them except for the depths.dev. I mean, anyone can access depths.dev. All of these live in foundations. Um, Tecton is part of the Continuous Delivery Foundation and, you know, community meetings, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, and then there's a couple more that I added at the bottom here just to check out the uh, package feeds and package analysis projects in the OpenSSF are interesting as well. They're trying to detect things like typo squatting, like while packages are being imported in package managers and not like at, um, you know, real-time scorecard type things. And then OSV is another interesting project that actually ties into scorecards a bit now, looking to see if there are any um, unpatched vulnerabilities. So that's an, another good one to check out. And I think we made it. <laughs> Thank you all for coming at the end of the day. <laughs> so we, we definitely have time for questions if anyone has any questions. Yes, David. Uh, it's not really a question, but it's kind yeah. of an observation. Uh, I mean, scorecards is running right now. Uh, some of the heuristics work much better than others. It doesn't have any trouble finding if there's a CI best practices fact, but detecting yeah. static analysis tools 
It turns out to be hard. Yeah. So it detects some well, it misses some. So this is actually a shield everybody else here, which is health scorecards. Be better. Get better <laughs> at some of those heuristics because some of them are challenging. Totally. To know what we're missing yet. Yeah, I think with all these things too, there's a bit of gaming that can happen, um, you know, and that's, we're just trying to do better, I guess, but yes, always room for improvement. <laughs> yeah, I think the CI test one was one I noticed in particular. I think it knows how to look at GitHub Actions and Prow, but it doesn't know about anything else, so yeah. it, it says a lot of projects don't have CI tests, but it just doesn't know how to evaluate, like, Azure pipelines, for yeah, example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so, so you mentioned the CI best practices badge itself. It has static analysis, but it uses certain CI, uh -huh. so it doesn't notice. Yeah. It, it's not an impossible problem. It's just yeah, yeah. Totally. And I think, I mean, that was one of the things, you know, as scorecards when we, it, it, when we first built, you know, the little, the project was just making sure that we could automate these things because that was sort of key for us to make sure they were scalable. Like you saw 150K repos. Now, if you really dig in and, and try to manually <laughs> check all these things, you know, we might not be able to scale as much. So I think there is a balance between those two things, but hopefully we can keep doing better uh, as the project progresses. Yeah. In, in the back. <laughs> so the question is, is scorecard the trick? So yeah, that was we actually have one cool trick. <laughs> that was the cool trick. I mean, the idea is like how you know how can we make these things more usable again in an easy fashion, automated fashion. Um, we've seen some projects, larger projects, uh, like use scorecards for their dependency policy. And so I think that the Envoy project, I'm not sure where they're current, but early on they were looking at it as a way to say for maintainers, you know, for the Envoy project. Like we want some sort of guidance, you know, if you're going to introduce a new dependency, let's try to give some sort of guidance on these things. And they were looking at scorecards as one way just to give some information um, as to the riskiness uh, of these projects. So yeah, <laughs> sorry if we disappointed that that was the cool trick. <laughs> That's a great question. Can you run this with just GitHub Actions or do you need Tecton? You can definitely run it with just GitHub Actions. Um, there's the, the scorecard project publishes a Docker image, so you can just run that Docker image as part of GitHub Actions or as part of any CI workflow that you want. Um, there's also a Tecton task that will run it. The, the, uh, the unknown bit and the, the answer to the cool trick bit as well is the part where something actually looks at a project, grabs all the dependencies and runs them for that. Um, and the missing thing there is really just a supported tool for each language to do that. Uh, but again, nothing that requires Tecton. You could do it with GitHub Actions, you could do it with Jenkins, Circle CI, anything you want. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh, that's a great question. So they're asked, she's asking um, on dev if, it, if there's not the most recent version of a project in there, like how can we get that included? Unfortunately, I don't know the answer. <laughs> I mean, I can try to dig and, and get back to you if you want to come give me your information after the, after the talk and I can try to follow up. Um, yeah. So it looks like you're checking for two things. Number one, it's a side maintainer shape, open branches, things like that, which if you need to fix, there's no, nothing malicious from the owner of the code. And then you're looking for easy to find malicious stuff, which is not that different from what uh, Google was doing with Android, right? Trying people trying to do malicious things in binaries and they're doing analysis and trying to find the rootkits in there. And whatever tests you write, the person doing this, once they know your test, they can write another thing to get around it so you don't get it. Right. <laughs> so yeah. I have a feeling that the very first part is very helpful, but the second part is really just catching people who are behind or not trying very hard. Mm -hmm. But like a real attacker is not going to get caught by that. Is that a fair thing to say? I think that's a good point. Uh, I would say that I think that that's kind of the, <laughs> my observations from the outside of security are that <laughs> I think that's sort of the nature of security to some extent in that you're kind of always playing catch up. There's always this one group that's kind of finding new things to check and there's this other group that's watching what they're doing and then trying to like dance around it and find new ways. So. I think with something like the binary artifact check, like actually full disclosure, if you look at it, <laughs> it's just looking for file extensions at the moment. So tricking it is extremely easy right now. Okay. So <laughs> you can imagine the next iteration, maybe we're looking at what's actually in the file, then an attacker is going to find a way around that. But you're kind of, you're making it, you're narrowing 
the, uh, what you can get away with so that it's harder and harder and harder. So I think we'll never have a perfect solution, but we'll just be making things better. more challenging. <laughs> more challenging. Have those been based on real attacks that you've seen, or you were just doing that 2024 for now? Uh, do you mean like the, the, uh, the binary, binary, artifacts. binary artifacts in particular? I don't know any other tests you've written. Did you find some malicious code that was out there that you wrote tests for? I haven't written any of this, but maybe. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't, we haven't found any yet, but I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if it can capture something that we're not aware of. Like the pin dependency stuff, like that kind of check would have helped with the code cub attack, for example. Um, and, and I mean, that's one of the things we're trying to do, you know, with scorecards and, and also the salsa framework is really map these things to real world attacks, real th threats that we've seen and not just make this stuff up, like, you know, because it's fun to build a lot of these things and engineer a lot of these things together, but show that it actually would have helped in these specific instances. Yes, please. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, repeat it for the recording. Yeah, they were saying um, a, a bunch of the people working on the scorecards have been uh, accumulating these attacks to apply it back to how they're building out the project. Yes. In, in salsa level four, you had an O on reproducible builds. <laughs> hey, David Wheeler. <laughs> Which, do you want me to repeat the question? So the question was in the salsa level four, the highest level of the salsa framework right now, there's a little zero that's not like a clear checkbox or a clear like not required thing for salsa level four on reproducible builds requirement. Do you want to elaborate on that one or do you want me to? <laughs> Now they're, they're really, you know, here's what we think makes sense, and now we have a much broader community discussing things. Um, Google's very confident in their building environment, and you know, they work incredibly hard. Other people are less confident in either their or just build environments in general. Mm -hmm. um, if you are not absolutely certain that your build environment is crystal clear and wonderful, the, the, one of the strongest countermeasures is reproducible builds. If you totally trust your build environment, eh, what are you worried about? Mm -hmm. um, so this is one of those areas where there's ongoing discussion um, you know, about what, what should be a requirement, what should not. Um, it, it, I mean, if you look at the docs on, it's on the site, it still says it's drafted and it's in progress. Mm -hmm. uh, but, that, but see, again, that says that now is the right time <laughs> to get involved if you have you know, different experiences and different backgrounds. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, for I, maybe David probably agrees that reproducible builds is a great end state where you get a bit for bit, you know, matching of these software artifacts, no matter what build system, you know, you're building it on, but actually achieving that, you know, all around is no, no, no easy task. Uh, so I think the, the indication of the circle here, if I remember <laughs> correctly, is kind of like best effort. We would love to see this in this level. Um, maybe Salsa 5 is a, is a checkbox, you know, <laughs> TBD. Yeah, yeah. Because whether or not reproducible builds is easy or hard depends a lot on the circumstances. For yeah. some, it's actually easy. For some, it's really hard. And so the dis it's, it's a complicated discussion. Yeah. And, and that's one of the goals and the motivations for the Salsa framework, too, is to really like just come to a common language with the broader community and organizations. And, and we can say, like, hey, David, I trust your build system. And so I know if you're building an artifact on your Salsa level four compliant build system that I trust that I don't need to rebuild it myself, or maybe if I do rebuild it myself, we can get the reproducible, you know, bit for bit thing, or, or maybe, you know, these really critical projects to the, to the community, to, to, to organizations, you know, David's building it, I'm building it, you can compare at the end that these are things are in ha and have more trustworthiness in the process to, to create it. Yeah, in a way it sounds like we almost need something like Tecton for build systems, right, whether that's Star Wars or something else, where you can give the same input to multiple different verifiers. Yep. And how much of a reproducible build? Because build systems also include timestamps and stuff. Anything we will never have two bits of a bit. No. I, 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 that's actually a standard well known. No, for those who are not familiar with reproducible builds, the idea is to rebuild things and get the right answer. If you allow.
allow random dates, then clearly you're not going to get bit for bit answers. Um, there are actually well known kernel issues. I'm sorry? The kernel build does not include um, actually, they, they're, 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 if you go to the curve box, they explain how to create Now we see why it's a circle. Yeah. <laughs> yes, definitely. Hey, here we go. This is why it's a circle. Um, <laughs> there are solutions, but now you have extra steps, which really comes back to the OA. You know, there are ways to deal with it. There is a new bit of work trying to solve this, separating the metadata of the build process from the actual input and output binary. Great discussions. <laughs> all right. I'm going to the bar. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Um, yeah. All these projects would love, you know, more input and, and, and more thoughts and discussions. So come join us. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks.